Welcome to Palm Sunday. Uh, kind of an unusual way to be celebrating it, but uh, but here we are. Just a couple of announcements before uh, we get to the service. Uh, the bishops did get to get together. You may remember that they talked about uh, meeting on April 1st to discuss how to move forward in terms of our services and whatnot, and they have concluded uh, the obvious, what we anticipated they would, that we will continue uh, withholding services and meetings and gatherings uh, for yet another three more weeks through to the end of April, and they will revisit it there uh, once again. But I have some good news uh, coming up uh, in regards to, to all of that. The first is uh, Bishop Charlie will be preaching on Easter Sunday. He will, uh, I will download a sermon of his that he's preparing especially for this coming Easter, and uh, we will include that in our Easter Sunday service online here. Also on Good Friday, uh, we plan on having a live uh, video conference Good Friday service of prayer and liturgy, and that is coming up on Good Friday. You've probably received the email by now. You should have, and if you are interested, just email me back and I'll include you on the list that is coming up. So the measures have been extended. Uh, we will not be gathering in the sanctuary anytime soon, uh, just as yet. I think I've covered it all. Um, oh, and throughout Holy Week, this is the beginning of Holy Week, uh, we will have uh, each bishop in Anik will be reading some scriptures. So as soon as I get the link to that, I will post it uh, on our Facebook page, on our web page, and I'll also email you a copy of the link so you can. So the bishops will be reading uh, scripture, particularly for Holy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, etc., uh, throughout the week. So I'll uh, I'll make sure that you get uh, connected with that. I think that's it for about now. Uh, just uh, quiet your hearts for a moment and then we will begin our uh, special service actually. We're not going to share uh, the elements this morning but we are going to hold a communion service and instead of sharing the elements we will have a special prayer called spiritual communion. So let's uh, quiet our hearts in preparation for our Palm Sunday service. Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Dear brothers and sisters, from the beginning of Lent until now, we have been preparing our hearts by repentance and self-sacrifice. Today, with the whole church, we herald the beginning of the celebration of the Paschal Mystery. On this day, our Lord Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem and was welcomed as king with palms and shouts of praise. Today, we greet him as our king. Though we know his crown was a crown of thorns and his throne a cross. Therefore, I invite you to follow our Lord this holy week from his triumphal entry through his suffering and death to the glory of his resurrection. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God, of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And let's say the Collect for Purity together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, Lord have, have mercy, mercy on us and, and write these, all these laws, laws in, in our hearts. hearts. And let's pray the collect for Palm Sunday together. Almighty, Almighty and, and ever-living ever God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature 
and to suffer death upon the cross by giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We'll read Psalm 22 responsively. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Glory be to, to the, the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, chapter 21, beginning at the first verse. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them on, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I pretty much love all of the church holidays, Easter, Christmas, and Palm Sunday is no exception to that. I just love the joy that we get in uh, in celebrating and in blessing the palms and in processing together, waving the palms and celebrating our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as King. And we sing songs like all glory, laud, and honor. And then during Holy Week, we would enter a quiet time of prayer and we would, many of us would meet together uh, in the evenings during Holy Week and pray, a uh, contemplative prayer together. And the more we pray, the, the bigger our anticipation of that day that comes next Sunday, and that is Easter Sunday when we celebrate uh, the risen Lord. Well, I don't need to tell you that 
times now are different and things have changed uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, we're relegated to our own homes. We're self-isolating for the protection of others. We're doing good work by doing these things. But if you're like me, you're starting to find it a little frustrating and and a little difficult. And uh, you're looking for some sort of peace. And someone was once telling me that, that it's kind of like the stages of grief that we're going through, that we're kind of sad, we're shocked, and then we, we reach a point of anger and frustration. And my prayer is that is that during those times, when we reach those times, we have we have some very important thing in our heart, and that is that the circumstances around us, are though, although they are difficult, are not where our hearts should be fixed, especially at this time of year. This is certainly not our expectation of our Palm Sunday service. It will not be our expectation of our Easter Sunday service either, because we love to join together and celebrate together and worship together and gather around the Lord's table together. So we're not used to what I would call this collective turmoil, and I think that's important to understand, that the whole world is participating in this retreat. We're not alone in this, and we're all doing this for the same good reason, to stop, stop the spread of this particular disease. And so we're all working together to protect the vulnerable and to heal the sick. We're serving one another in one single crisis. I've never seen this before, where the whole globe is battling one particular problem, one particular goal, and that we've band together to defeat it. So things are different, and we're living kind of separately, yet together again. In our reading of Matthew's Gospel this morning, there's also another air of expectation, that things are expected, and, and we expect they expect things to go the way that they've planned them, or the, the way that they've understood them. Matthew 20:11 recounts an, an amazing event, and we're going to talk about that, uh, chapter 21, uh, verses 1 to 11. But at, and when we preach, you see, when we structure sermons, uh, we often uh, think about sermon points. So uh, some people say it's good to have one point, some people say it's good to have two points, and most people say it's best to have three points. I, however, just let the text determine how many points are being made. And in this particular text, there are three points being made. And if you take notes, uh, write these down. Number one, Jesus is king. Number two, Jesus is king. Number three, Jesus is still king. Let me repeat that for you. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Jesus is still king. Let's take a look at the text, and we will find out a few about that, uh, a little bit about that. This is the triumphal entry, we call it. Uh, we could have another name for it, but there's a triumphal entry. Jesus is making his approach to Jerusalem, and he's traveling with his disciples, and his eyes are fixed on Jerusalem now. They're fixed on his ministry of the cross. And so he and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem, and they stop partway down the uh, Mount of Olives, and they stop at a city called, a little village actually called Bethvedge, just outside. And Jesus sends in a couple of disciples to pick up a donkey and a colt and to bring them to him. Now, to an ordinary person, a donkey and a colt, and uh, Jesus wants these, these animals to ride into Jerusalem, that to an ordinary person, that's probably a good way of transporting yourself around the desert. However, there's something very special being said here, and the text talks about that. So Jesus uh, withdrew to Jerusalem. They were on their way to Jerusalem. They went to Bethphage, uh, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you, immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And he says, If anyone says anything, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place, Matthew tells us, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And this is in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, Zion is Jerusalem, so the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the beast of a burden. 
And for the Israelites, for the Jews, this is precisely how the son of David is to enter the city of Jerusalem on top of a donkey, riding a donkey into the holy city. So this is pretty much solid evidence here to any Jew that the king of Israel has arrived. So Jesus rides the donkey. Now there's some there's some talk about donkey and colt, and uh, Matthew's the only one that includes two of them traveling with with Jesus. And I think he rides the colt, and and I think that the donkey's brought along because the colt is supposed to be never ridden before, so it's never broken in. So the colt is so young that it still needs his mother. So the mother comes along, but Jesus is riding the colt, not both the donkeys. Not the donkey and the colt, not both at the same time, not strapped between, but he is riding the colt as is prophesied. So there's a crowd that follows him because they see the identifying mark that Jesus is king. So Jesus is recognized as king. Second point, Jesus plays his hand as king. And that's what's going on in this whole episode of the triumphal entry is Jesus is playing his hand as king. On this day, he shows the sign of being a Jewish king. Before this, you may remember in Matthew that he, he tell us tell everybody to keep, keep, keep him a secret. So he would heal somebody or perform a miracle and he would say, don't tell anybody else. Keep this under the hush-hush. I don't want this to get out just yet. So whenever he healed someone, he told them to keep it quiet. He didn't want people to know about his ministry because it wasn't time for them to know. But now we see that it is time for no, because Jesus doesn't ride into town quietly. You'll notice that, that the crowd gathers. And the text actually implies that there's a crowd following him from behind, and there's a crowd coming out of the city of Jerusalem to meet him. He is the Jewish king, and there is a big kerfuffle, a big noise, and a big celebration. And people are laying their cloaks as a sign of honor. They're laying their cloaks along the road, and they're laying palms along the road to welcome their king into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is going public. We call this the triumphal entry, but we can also call it Jesus goes public. Jesus is now making public his assertion that he is a king. And the whole Jewish world is responding to that in celebration and in recognizing him. So Jesus rides down a public road. All eyes are on him. And and Matthew says the whole city is charged up. The whole city is quaking with excitement that this king is finally arrived, this long-awaited Jewish king. And they're shouting, Son of David. That's the title for the next Messiah, son of David. And they shout, Hosanna, which means save. Save us. Son of David, save us. Son of David, save us. And so they they know and they recognize Jesus as king, and they know that Jesus has come to do something for them. Jesus has come to save them. So Jesus has established himself as king. He makes his kingship public. And then point number three is he's totally misunderstood. They don't understand why Jesus had come. So he comes to Jerusalem. He makes it public. He plays his hand as king. And in doing all of this and drawing attention to himself, finally, he's throwing down the gloves, if you will, for the religious and the political leaders. So he's setting himself up for a battle. So the crowd is all excited because they think that Jesus has come in to battle the oppressive Romans and the oppressive religious leaders. So they were looking for salvation of some sort. They were looking for Jesus to save them from all the temporal difficulties that they had in life. But they misunderstood. And this misunderstanding can go all the way back to Matthew chapter 20. And I just want to go back there for a second in verses uh, verses 18. So Jesus um, actually makes it clear what's going to happen. He makes it absolutely clear what's going to happen. He says that he's going to be delivered to the Gentiles. He says he's going to be mocked. He says he's going to be flogged. And he says he's going to be crucified. And he says that on the third day, he rises again. Now, when he said that, the Zebedee brothers and their mother was there. And I don't know what about that the Zebedees could not understand. But their mother and the two boys approached Jesus. And the mother says to Jesus, he says, uh, she says, um, 
say that these two sons of mine, that is James and John, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Now, what does that mean? Well, they don't have in view a heavenly kingdom. They have in view a warrior Jesus who will one day take over and govern the city of Jerusalem and govern the country in the same way worldly governments govern. So they were looking to be high up on the list. They were looking to be um, a deputy prime minister and, 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 and secretary of defense or, or whatever, but they were looking for these high positions because they had in their minds that Jesus had come to conquer in a military way. And so this is the mood that is transferred over to the crowd as they celebrate. They're celebrating for the same reasons. They believe that Jesus had come to save them from oppression. They were not celebrating the forgiveness of sins. They were not celebrating the spiritual nature of Jesus. They had no clue what Jesus was going to do once he got beyond the gates of Jerusalem. They had an idea. They had an expectation. But it was the wrong expectation. They totally misunderstood. They believed that Jesus would enter into the city of Jerusalem and he would fight the religious leaders. And he would fight the political leaders. And he would take over the city military style. So that's their expectation, right? That's their king, riding on a donkey as prophesied. And they shower him with palms, they lay cloaks on the ground as a sign of respect, and their expectation was that Jesus would enter into Jerusalem and start an uprising. Now I think we know the rest of the story. If we look ahead on the week, and the following five days, we'll see just how wrong they are, just how their expectations of Jesus were just totally off. That they had their temporal wants, they had their felt needs, they wanted to be released of oppression, they've heard that Jesus can cure diseases, they heard that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they knew that Jesus was the man who was powerful enough to overtake the oppressors. But Jesus enters into Jerusalem, and when Jesus looks through the gate of the city, he doesn't see a battle like that. In fact, he sees humility and submission. He sees conflict. He sees betrayal. He sees denial. He sees trial. He sees conviction. He sees torture. And he sees death. And that's how Jesus was looking through the gates of Jerusalem in a totally unexpected way. And we know that as the week goes on, all of the crowd, as each one of these things happen, and as they begin to see how, in a worldly sense, how weak Jesus is. I mean, no king stands in submission before Pilate. I mean, it just doesn't happen, at least not in the worldly understanding. So the more that Jesus appears weak to them, the more they leave and the more they abandon him. And by Good Friday, Jesus dies alone. The crowd has long gone. The parade is long over. And so what's, what's the point of all this? Why am I exactly explaining things to you this way? Well, the point is, is whether or not we see Jesus meeting our earthly needs, he's still king. See, like the crowd, we are not privy to the complete understanding of God's will. And in the same way that they didn't understand that Jesus was a servant king, that Jesus would serve and gain victory not over oppression, not over a worldly adversary, but victory over, over sin, victory over death, the ultimate victory, really, that is in their best, best, best interest. They didn't see that. They just saw that Jesus was unable to meet their, their worldly or temporal needs, their felt needs. And folks, i got to admit that sometimes I pray and Jesus doesn't meet my needs. Jesus doesn't answer my prayer the way I want him to answer, or as quickly as I would like him to answer. In fact, indeed, even, even in my suffering, my heart attacks years ago, I remember sitting on the bed and just asking Jesus to, to heal me and heal me quickly. And yet I got four more heart attacks after that. 
It was a long journey of suffering. And it's hard to understand where God is in all of that. It's hard to understand the love of Jesus when you're suffering. But I'm telling you that just as Jesus kept his eyes fixed on the will of the Father, just as Jesus kept his eyes fixed on the cross through his suffering, then so are we to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus through our suffering. And that's an important message. Because regardless of how we feel, Jesus is still king. Jesus was king on Christmas Day. Remember celebrating Christmas? Jesus was king at Epiphany. Jesus was king on Ash Wednesday. Jesus is king on Palm Sunday. Jesus will be king on Good Friday. He will be king on Easter Sunday. Jesus will be king forever. And he hasn't lost his grip on the world. He's still king. He's not puzzled by what's happening to us right now, to the world. And he hasn't lost his grip on you. You may feel that he's perhaps not meeting a need. Maybe he's not healing you fast enough. Maybe he's not, he's not curing this disease worldwide quickly enough for us. But he's still king. And we still must look to him through our suffering. If that is the only goal, if that is the only objective of what is happening here. So in the same way that Jesus fixed his eyes on the kingdom of God through his suffering, I urge you to fix your eyes on Jesus through yours. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We We believe in one God, the the Father, Father, the the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most Most merciful merciful God, God, we confess confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, 
have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. And now we'll say a prayer of spiritual communion. It speaks from a heartfelt desire to share in the body and blood and the elements together, and which is something that we cannot do right now. So this prayer calls on Jesus to enter into our hearts in the absence of that sacrament as a church. So let's pray this together. Dear Dear Jesus, I I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And now, as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let's say the doxology together. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus. Forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and to serve our Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.